Have you ever had one of those moments where your freedom bumps up against the authority that's been placed over you? I remember as a kid, I could not wait to be a grown up because when you're a grown up, you can do whatever you want. If you want to stay up all night, sleep all day, you can. If you want to eat ice cream three meals a day, you can. If, if you want to never eat a vegetable again, you can. Clearly, I had a very naive view of what adulthood is. <laughs> But I thought there's this ultimate freedom ahead of me that I can do whatever I want with my life. And I remember a time where I tried to exercise that freedom a bit too early. I was a teenager living with my parents, of course, and we had a rule in our home. You don't listen to music that has cuss words in it. It was just a rule and uh, we were all subject to it. And so uh, one day though, my mom sent me loose in a Portland mall with money Uh, to go buy some school clothes for back to school. And uh, I saw this as an opportunity to exercise my freedom to do whatever I want. I went straight to the CD store. Now, if you don't know what a CD is, kids, it's a physical copy of music. Music has not always miraculously come to our ears through the internet. When I was trying to explain this to my kids, they did not understand it. They're like, dad, but you can't see music. So how did you hold a physical CD? Um, But there was a store in the mall called Sam Goody. And I went into that store and my sole goal was to get the most ridiculous CD with the terrible content. And so I just looked for a dumb CD with with the, the parental advisory sticker on it. Purchased that, put it in the bottom of my shopping bag to hide it from my mom. And uh, when we got home, she starts going through my, my, my clothing that I, pu- I purchased and she gets to the bottom of my bag and she's like, oh, what's this? And I said, uh, oh, it's a CD. And she's like, oh, you didn't tell me you bought a CD. And, and she's pulling it out of the bag and I'm trying to divert her attention to something else. And she says, oh, interesting, look at this. It says, parents should be advised of the content of this album. <laughs> and I'm like terrified. And she opens the CD case, pulls out the lyric booklet and inside uh, she took one look at the lyrics takes a CD out of the case and snaps it in half and therefore crushing all of my dreams of freedom right there alongside it. Today, we are going to continue our series in 1 Peter. And we're going to be looking at the idea of freedom and submission. Two ideas that seem to be contradiction to one another that Peter puts right side by side in this passage. And I want to be forthright. As we go through 1 Peter 2, uh, we're going to be 16 to 25. And right in the middle of our passage today is the landmine issue of slavery. And I know as I say that, there, there are opinions, there are feelings, there's maybe even emotion that comes into the room. Because slavery is an atrocity that has been a part of human history throughout it. And it's not just something that happened a long time ago. It is still happening today. It's called human trafficking. And so I understand when we talk about slavery, there's lots of feeling and emotion and opinion that that can raise up. And what I'm not asking us to do today is just throw that out the window. I want us to hold that intention together. But what I am asking is that we continually come back to what is Peter's aim in this passage? Because the difficult thing is Peter does not outright denounce the human institution of slavery. Peter's aim in this passage is to speak to slaves, which some commentators say would have been upwards of 25% of his audience. This was a very common thing in the Roman empire. At any given time, there was uh, 60 million slaves. Almost every Roman household had at least one or two. And these people were dehumanized. They had no rights, though it wasn't race-based like American slavery, they, it was the dehumanization of an individual. And he's speaking to these slaves who have heard the gospel and they've repented and placed their faith in Jesus. And they're saying, look, I'm hearing about this freedom I have in Christ and yet I'm a slave. How do I live? And so Peter addresses them and tells them how to live in the human institution of slavery they find themselves in. He's really showing them how the gospel meets the grit of their life. That just because they find themselves as, as according to the world, a slave and not free, does not mean that the gospel, that they're disqualified from gospel living. So he's going to give them instructions on how to live out the gospel in the human institution of slavery they find themselves in. That's where we're going today. And I want us to keep that in mind because that was Peter's 
aim as he wrote to the slaves. So we'll be in 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 16. He says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. He says, live as people who are free. That in the original language, people who are free is one word. And it can be translated freed men or freed women or freed people. This is an identity, identity that he speaks over these slaves and, and, and over the, the exiles that he's writing to, that they are free. The prison door has been opened. The shackles have been removed. Spiritually speaking, they have been released from that bondage. And now they get to learn how to live in the freedom they have in Christ. But they're called to not use that freedom as a cover-up for evil. This, I'm free, now I get to do whatever I want, like my foolish teenage mind thought. Freedom is getting to do whatever you want. He says, no, that's not true freedom. True freedom is not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, a license to, to continue in sin, but to live as servants of God. That's true freedom. Verse 17, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Drew did kind of a deep dive on this last week. So I'm not going to dive into that verse today, but I did want to include verse 16 because it is a linchpin verse on where we're going with the rest of this passage. All right. So if you didn't get to see last week's message, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to what Drew had to say on verse 17. But I want us to keep this idea of freedom at the forefront of our mind. What would it mean for a slave to live spiritual freedom out? He continues, verse 18, servants. Now the word there is not, as this is not a hired hand. This is not a paid position. This is a house slave. Again, this is Roman slavery. It was socially acceptable at the time. And most households had slaves. These were, they, they were objects. They were, like, um, they, they were like a tool, like a hammer with a mouth. They had no value, no identity, no rights, couldn't marry. Um, they were used as objects for work. Um, they were also used as objects for pleasure and, and sometimes were forced to be sex slaves. And so this is a, a grotesque and awful institution these men and women find themselves in. And Peter here is speaking to them. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Whoa. They're called in the midst of this slavery, this human institution, to submit to their masters. And he makes, uh, he makes the call even higher here. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. You see, it was very common for Roman slaves to be beaten and, and brutalized objects. And in fact, if a Roman killed their slave, there was no penalty under the law because there was no value for slaves. They didn't have an identity. They had no rights. And so they could, they could exact punishment um, without any uh, recourse of justice against them. And so he's saying, I want you to subject, literally to come under the authority of them, to submit even to the unjust. Now, naturally, the question there is, what? Why? Why, Peter? Why, God? And we'll get there. Peter, actually, Peter will get there. But I want us to hold this tension here. This is a brutal institution. And they're called to submit even when injustice is being done against them. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering justly. It's a gracious thing. When God looks down and he sees the, the plight, he's, he's not far off and distant. He sees them in the midst of their suffering. And when they, when they endure these sorrows and unjust suffering, mindful of God, it's a gracious thing to him. That idea of being mindful of God is being, uh, uh, having a clear conscience before the Lord. This is living for the Lord's sake. Remember earlier in the passage, Drew taught on this last week, all of this submission that we're called to and that these slaves and exiles are called to is for the Lord's sake. So this is mindful of God is living for the Lord, not just obeying your master for the sake of obeying your master, obeying your master because you're living for the Lord's sake. And he continues, verse 20, 
For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? He says, look, if you sin against your master and there's a consequence, that's natural. That, that's that's a naturally built in. There's consequences for sin. And the word that he uses there for credit is actually has to do with the reputation of the individual. And so if you're a slave and your master asks you to do something and you disobey, how does that reflect on you as a slave that they know has become a Christian? And how does that reflect on Christ as you are the living example of Christ in that sphere of influence you're in, in that slavery? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of of God. Think about what this meant for these slaves. They are unseen individuals, so much so that they don't have identity. They're objects. And Peter's saying, God sees you in the sight of God. He watches your gracious, loving, gospel-centered, holy submission, even in the midst of injustice. He sees you. He goes on, for to this you have been called. This is a hard calling for these slaves, right? This is not fair. This is not right. They, I mean, Peter even calls out the slave masters for their injustice. He, he calls it what it is, unjust treatment. And this is the calling. This is what God had ordained for these slaves. This is the, what they have been called to. For the, to this you have been called. God's calling is always greater than God's people. They can't live this out by themselves. They need the, the indwelling of God, the power of God within them to be able to live submissive lives, even in the midst of their suffering, even in the midst of injustice done against them. He says, for to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. When they live this way, they're exhibiting the way that Christ lived. And he's going to say how Christ was treated and, and what his response, he's going to tease out that Christ was treated with injustice too. And what was his response? It wasn't to overthrow. It wasn't to fight back. Christ's response was Humble obedience to the will of the Father and by submitting himself to the governing authorities over him. Look at it. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he revi was reviled, he did not revile in return. Revile means to heap abuse on somebody verbally. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. How did Jesus work through this whole thing? He knew the people who are overseeing my execution, my beatings, my mock trials are not the ultimate authority. The father is. And he continued to entrust himself to him who judges justly, the father who is an impartial judge from earlier in this, in the book. We read about that a couple of weeks ago. We have a father who's an impartial judge and will judge the deeds of humanity, including these unjust slave owners. Going on, talking about Jesus, he said, he himself bore our sins, in, our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. It's a common theme in 1 Peter, the, the dying to sin and living righteous, obedient, submissive, holy lives. Peter holds that call very high. Die to sin, live to righteousness. And I love the last few lines here. It's so um, pastoral or, or shepherding of Peter to, to leave these lines in here as he was inspired by the Spirit. By his wounds, you have been healed. Think about what this meant for a slave. They could be beaten with impunity and, and, and they couldn't advocate for themselves. They knew what it meant to need healing, physical, mental, emotional healing from the beatings, from the sexual assaults and rapings. They understood the need for healing. And here he says, by his wounds, you have been healed. There is a deep balm for your soul in Christ. There's healing that brings true healing, true freedom from the scars you've experienced. He continues on with this lofty, beautiful language. For you were straying 
like sheep. Sheep are prone to get themselves in precarious situations, often being in a defenseless moment, uh, falling prey to a predator or stuck in brambles and dying. He says, you were like sheep. You were getting into dangerous, defenseless situations. But have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You see, for these slaves in the midst of of this brutal institution of slavery, he's saying, God is with you. He is shepherding you. You've come back to him. He's shepherding you. He's overseeing you. He's not far away. He's in the midst of the muck with you. The gospel really does meet the grit of life. And he's bringing healing to you. And so this is the high call that Peter and God through the writings of Peter has called the original audience, these slaves, into. And I want to comb back through the text and see what, as a result of what Peter wrote here, what are we now called to? Because though this was not written to us, it was written for us. So we're going to comb back through. The first thing I want us to see is Peter called the original audience and us to live free. Now, when you see that state, that that phrase, live free, what do you think of? Or do you think maybe like me when I was a teenager thinking, I can't wait to do whatever I want. That's true freedom. How would you define freedom? You see, I think often this is very twisted in American culture. Because we have bought into a lie that freedom is the ability to do whatever I want. But biblically speaking, no one has that kind of freedom. No one. There is no such thing as a free moral agent. Romans 6 makes it very clear from, I think it's verses 20 to 22 or 23 there, um, where he talks about that we are either slaves to sin or slaves to God. I'm either a slave to sin. This is before Christ. I'm a slave to sin. I obey it as my master, following the course of this world and the prince of the power of the air from Ephesians 2. Or I'm a slave of God and I'm under his loving, caring, gracious, truthful, holy guidance. But there's no third option. Everyone falls into one of those two categories, slave of sin, slave of God. None of us just get to do whatever we want. We will obey our master, whether it's the evil master of sin and Satan, or whether it's the gracious, loving care of the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And so this idea of freedom is very, uh, very much convoluted in our American culture. That we, that we can live and do whatever we want. That's not reality, spiritually speaking. And even in the church, this gets a bit distorted. In the church, often we say freedom is being released from the power of sin. And that's so true. I want you to hear that. I'm not saying that's not true. The gospel means you've been forgiven from the penalty of your sin. You're being released from the power of your sin. And one day you will be, by God's grace, released from the presence of sin. So true. But this is not the fullness of a biblical definition of freedom. And we'll see this in the passage. But I want us to wrestle through re, uh, deconstructing what we believe freedom to be. And here's the definition of freedom, I think, lines up with the passage we're, we're going to look at. Freedom is being released from the power of sin to obey God. Being released from the power of sin to obey God. Yes, you're being freed from the power of sin over you. You've been set free. The prison door is open. Shackles are off. And now you're learning how to live in that freedom. And living in that freedom looks like obedience to the Lord. Let's look at it in the passage. Live as people who are free. How do you do that? Not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, doing whatever I want, but living as servants of God. That's the obeying the Lord. So here's the question I want us to wrestle with. Are you being set free? Like, do you see freedom growing in your life? And I I, want to be honest with you. Right now, I don't. Um, Over the last several months, as I've been looking at my life and evaluating the fruit of my life, I see anxiety, fear, a desire for control. I see uh, worry. 
And, and I was talking to my friend, Zach, the other day, and I was like, hey man, I need some encouragement. I am not seeing the freedom in my life. Do you see it? And throughout that conversation, he was able to say, hey man, I see that you're growing here and here. He was able to show me areas that I was blind to because I'm so close to my life. I don't notice it when I'm making progressive steps in my freedom, learning how to live as a free person outside of the bondage of my slavery to sin that Christ set me free from. I'm continually learning how to do that, but I was blind to it. And I, I've asked him several times over the last couple of months, hey, can you help me see this? And so maybe you look at this question and you're like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I'm being set free. I want to encourage you. This is why Christian community is so important. If you're not in a discipleship relationship or a life group, you need to be. If you're not in a discipleship relationship, a disciple making relationship, excuse me, or a life group, you need to be. Because we need brothers and sisters that can speak into the areas of our lives that, that, we're, that we need it. I needed Zach to say, hey man, you are growing. Don't be discouraged. The gospel is changing you. I see it and help me see it. I also need brothers and sisters around me that can say, hey man, you're, you're not walking in freedom right now. You're walking as a slave to sin. You're walking in who you used to be, not who, you, who you, God has made you to be. And so if you're not in a disciple-making relationship or a life group, please, Get into community. You need it. I need it. We need it. And if you are looking at this idea of being set free and you're thinking, well, I see the fruit of my life is not good. Um, I'm just going to change that. There's a helpful tool that I've been using and that the church leadership and we've kind of unpacked in some sermons in the past um, called Fruit to Root. And it's on the back of your outline. This is Fruit to Root. And what it is, is a repentance process where you go through first a confession of sin. If you look at the, lot, the, the fruit of your life, like I did, uh, desire for control, anxiety, fear, a lack of self-control, and you see things that are contrary to the fruit of the Spirit, then you begin to go through a process of asking yourself some questions because all sinful behavior is rooted in lies. All of it. And so, and just to change the behavior doesn't change the lie that's fueling that behavior. So we have to get to the root, uproot it, and replace it with truth. That's what this process is. So the first question to ask, when I'm ex exhibiting this uh, fruit, fruit of fear or anxiety or desire for control, who, who am I? Well, I'm not in control, but I believe I need to be. Okay, now as a result of that, what has God done? When I'm experiencing that fruit, what has God done? Well, I believe he's left me and I believe um, he has no power. E he, everything's gotten out of control. So as a result of those beliefs, who is God then? If those things are true, who's God? Well, God's impotent and unloving. Now I know we all know those things aren't true. We know that here, but sometimes we don't know that here and it doesn't play out in our lives. And so we have to be honest answering these questions. And then we go through a repentance moment where we confess uh, the truth, a confession of faith. So I believe these things about God, but who is God truly? Well, God's, God's not impotent. He's all powerful and God's not unloving. God is love. So what has God done to show me that? Well, God on the cross, this is the definitive statement of love. And then three days later, he rose from the grave. That's a definitive statement of his power. God's not impotent. God's not unloving. Well, then as a result of that, who am I? Well, I'm loved. And I'm indwelt with the power of God as he lives in me. What do I begin to experience as I think about that truth? Love, joy, peace the fruit of the spirit. So maybe you're looking at your life and saying, am I being set free? I don't know. Um, to address the lie is the first step. And this is a helpful process in that endeavor to live as free people. The next thing Peter calls them to is to live submitted. And again, we need to define what submission is because when I think of submission, I think of my teenage self again. Uh, mom asked me to do the dishes. Oh, 
I'll do the dishes. Like this begrudging, I have to. And even for the slaves at this time, right? Like the slave masters didn't earn their submission. And so understandably, they could be submitting begrudgingly. But the word there is not a begrudging submission. This is what, this is kind of my brief def- definition of biblical submission graciously yielding one's self to another. Gracious yielding of oneself to another. And I put that word gracious there intentionally because the masters haven't earned this kind of submission. They haven't shown themselves to be people of justice and character, but God has called them to graciously yield themselves. And grace is when something has not been earned, but you give it anyways. Graciously yielding oneself to another. And I do want to be clear. Earthly authority ends when it bumps up against God's authority. Earthly authority ends when it bumps up against God's authority. If an earthly authority asks you to do something that God has said not to do, God wins every time. And so we're not to obey earthly masters for the sake or to dis- and disobey the Lord. But we're called to graciously yield oneself to another. Let's look at it in the passage. Servants, be subjects to your masters with all respect. Be subject, come under them. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. That's the gracious yielding. They haven't earned this. And this is a gracious thing. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. That idea of mindful of God, again, is having a clear conscience before the Lord. You are living your life in the sight of of your heavenly father who is pleased with you and who is calling you to a deep level of holiness. It's a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. He calls out the plight of these slaves. He doesn't mince meat about it. He doesn't beat around the bush. He says, you're, you're suffering injustice. And God sees that as a gracious thing in his sight. And I want to be honest with you. As I've written this message, I struggle to take this passage and the call for the slaves to be submitted and apply it today. And I have an idea of what Peter's talking about and how it applies today. But what I've seen in the past is um, communicators, preachers, pastors take the idea of a slave and equate it with an employee. And a slave master is an employer and take a brutal situation that Peter was speaking into and put it over the modern day workplace. And I don't think we can make a one-for-one comparison here. Because what that does in the process is it trivializes what the slaves were going through and the high calling that God had on their life. And so at Family Church, we've adopted a, a, a philosophy of interpretation of the Bible from a book called Grasping God's Word. And I just want to briefly walk through that so you can get a picture of the, the difficulty in this passage. This is a, a graphic from the book. And anytime you're trying to move from what it meant to the original audience to what it means today, you go through this process, uh, the journey of interpretation. So you begin over here, step one. This is their town. This is the original audience. What did this passage mean to the original audience? Well, to them, it's pretty clear. Peter calls these slaves to submit whether they have a good or unjust master. That's fairly clear. Come under the authority. Okay? Okay. So then the second step is, okay, there's a river here between their context and modern day context. The river uh, is an illustration of what's the difference between then and now. The the language, the culture, the situation, the time, the covenant. And there's a lot of difference. While we're in the same covenant, the situation is vastly different. Roman slavery was a socially acceptable thing that was very common. Slavery has is, is been abolished in America and, and it is not socially acceptable. And so uh, you, you evaluate what are the differences between then and now? And then you begin to cross what we call the principalizing bridge. That's step number three. And that bridge is if you were to pull out a principle from the passage that's eternal, it can apply to the original context and the modern context. And then once you've got that principle, you Go to step four, consult the biblical map. As you look at the rest of scripture, is there anything that might contradict or inform the biblical principle you got in step three? And lastly, 
Step five is applying the passage to your modern context. And so as Paul calls these slaves to submit to their masters, he's calling them to gospel-centered, righteous, obedient, holy lives, even in the midst of injustice. They're called to live holy, and so are we. And so the principle I want to pull out of here is that holiness is not optional. Paul, or I'm sorry, not Paul. I said Paul. Peter, Peter called the slaves, even in the midst of injustice, to live this holy, submissive, obedient life, to be set apart, to be other. He says, if you, if you are treated with e- evil and, and you respond with evil, you're not living set apart. You're living like the world. Holiness is not optional. It wasn't for them and it isn't for us. And when I say holiness, I'm not saying that we have to prove our, our holiness by uh, obedience before God. No, you are holy. You are righteous. You do have self-control and you can submit yourself to the Lord. If you're in Christ, those things are true of you. That is the identity you have. And now you get to now live out of that identity. But holiness is not optional. It was true for them. It is true for us. And still you may ask yourself, but why? Why did God call them to this submission to these authorities that were evil? And it's because of the last point here, to imitate Christ. Let's look at it in the passage. He says, for to this, you've been called. Remember, God's calling is always bigger than God's people. They need God's power to be able to live this out. To this, you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. That they're, As they live these submissive, obedient lives, even in front of their slave master, their owner, that they are living like Christ. This is missional living. This is like being an incarnate sermon. That as they live this gospel obedience before their master, that they, that they, their master may come to faith and those who are watching their lives may come to, into the kingdom. This is Christ's example. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued to entrust himself to him who judges, judgely, or judges justly. Jesus, before his oppressors, was unmoved. Before his abusers, he did not fight back. Before his accusers, he was silent. Jesus is the example for our lives, even in the midst of injustice. And he was the example for these slaves, even in the midst of their injustice. The cross is both the source of our salvation and our example which is so countercultural because we want to uh, climb the ladder and push other people down. That's what the culture says is, is victory. Jesus says victory looks like downward. It looks like denying yourself. It looks like dying to yourself. It looks like uh, killing your sin. It looks like humility. It looks like submission. It looks like obedience. The cross is the source of our salvation. Yes, but is also the example of how we are called to live. Jesus was submissive even in the midst of injustice done against him. And you and I are called to do the same. Why? For the sake of the mission, because people are watching our lives. Your children are watching your life. Your family's watching your life. Your spouse, your friends, your coworkers are watching your life. And as they see you live out a gospel-centered holiness, maybe they'll be one to Christ as well. Thank you so much for wading into a difficult subject with me today. I encourage you to take this home and wrestle through this passage on your own in your family, with your spouse, or with a trusted friend and see what the Lord might say to you as well. I'm going to release to the campuses. Have a good Sunday.